so welcome everybody we also live stream this keynote so also welcome to all the people in front of their computers right now i think we will have a, we have a really great uh, speaker here and also the timing is fantastic because uh, 25 years ago almost to this date namely on may 27th 1994 the first electronic money payment was made over the internet and the person who made that payment was no one else than David Chaum who is our keynote speaker here and he also made <laughs> and the interesting thing is he made that payment in Switzerland during the keynote he gave at the time at the CERN in Geneva at the first uh, World Wide Web conference that was held there in 1994. So I think it's a great opportunity now, 25 years later, to have again uh, David here in Switzerland. And I guess you all know David, he is the true pioneer of the topics that we are we're talking about uh, and discussing today during our conference. Uh, he's, to my knowledge, the first person who really applied cryptography to, to money and tried to make digital money really similar to uh, cash. And um, so of great interest certainly also to uh, Central Bank. He pioneered both digital cash and decentralized networks. So David received his doctorate in computer science and business administration from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and also interesting, I think, to us is that his 1982 dissertation anticipated many of the elements of Satoshi's uh, Bitcoin white paper. Uh, after his dissertation, he was a professor at the New York University Graduate School of Business. He was uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. He also founded the International Association for Cryptologic Research, the cryptography group at the Center for Mathematics and Computer Science in Amsterdam. He founded DigiCash uh, and also the Voting Systems Institute. And currently he's working on his own blockchain version called Elixir. And for his many fundamental contributions to modern cryptography and computer science, he received the 1995 Information Technology European Award and the 2010 RSA Award for Excellence in Mathematics. So it's a great honor and a real pleasure to have you here, David. The floor is yours. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here with all of you. And it's, uh, it's so wonderful to uh, be in, in Zurich. And so I, I'm going to try to put the last 35 years in, into some perspective and also, uh, I guess, uh, give you some interesting new um, things. And the point of departure... And this really was my point of departure, and I think it is what we all really should be thinking about, because this is a, let's focus on this for a minute, and the rest of the talk can uh, sort of take, take care of itself. I mean, read scientific, uh, science fiction literature, for instance, uh, there are really basically two scenarios for the, the the future sort of co-habitation of the planet by people and computers, right? Either the... I think there's really only two ways it could play out. And I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts uh, privately afterwards if you can think of a third way. But I think it's either the, that the humans are kind of in control of the situation, and hopefully in a democratic sort of manner, so that the main uh, body of the population. The other scenario is where either the computers are uh, not that loving, uh, machines of, uh, of uh, loving kindness that uh, poets wrote about some time ago, they, maybe they are uh, manipulated by small 
fraction of the population against the rest of the population. I mean, this just look at the science fiction literature and it, and see. So if you, if you take this as a starting point, that then actually the question really becomes like a computer security one. And I took it upon myself to try to find technologies that would allow for the good answer. And also, I took it upon myself to make sure that those who were trying to block the adoption of those technologies did not succeed. So, very yeah, briefly here, you see we have, uh, I'm going to talk about four phases. So in phase zero, that's just trying to figure this out. What, it, what is really the key issue that we need to try to deal with so that computers and people can live together in a good way? And once that was figured out, then there really were three phases of operation needed. The first sort of was to invent those new ideas that are needed in order to make it plausible that the good way, the public in charge, I'm calling it here, the people win approach could prevail. So to come up with new concepts and, and breakthroughs that would uh, enable that and possibly have to take some actions against efforts that would have inhibited it, which I'll come to. And then during the uh, rollout of the World Wide Web, we had to kind of do proof of concept, proof of feasibility, technical trials, demonstrations, that sort of thing to convince the world and make sure we had it right and get, work the bugs out of the technologies that were key and central to this. And now that we're in the smartphone era and there's all this interest around blockchain and the like, it's, this is the moment to build out, the uh, un, without asking for permission, a uh, solution to ensure this peaceful coexistence. So, so what it really comes down to is kind of at, at two levels. So the first level is, are ordinary people able to do their ordinary life stuff, you know, buy food and, uh, and so forth, and uh, health insurance and, and, uh, and what have you, communicate with their friends and family, etc., in a way that is protected from abuse by information technology. And then we'll see there's, there's a second level, which is, OK, great, but can we do all the other kinds of things that society needs to do in order to keep on doing what it has been doing? And as we heard in the very interesting panel discussion at the end of the day, also, what really interesting new opportunities and innovations can we find and to, to take this, uh, up this uh, technology um, to, the, to the limit? So the, the first, I, and then these other uh, things are, are the, techno the, the technologies. Um, and this last one, the multi-party computation, that's the one that opens everything up completely, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but the first one, the International Association for Cryptologic Research, is the main 
Association and the Scientific Organization for Research in Cryptography. It publishes a journal. It has three flagship conferences each year and a half a dozen workshops and so on. It is the main organization in this field and I personally created it at a time when the director of the National Security Agency was writing letters to the heads of the existing scientific associations related to computing and electrical engineering, threatening them with the most draconian legal action if they were to even have sessions that included cryptography as a subject. And you can follow the link that looks like that on my charm.com website and read all about this and see all the, it's incredible, but there were articles in Science Magazine at the time reporting this. So what I did, this was before Snowden, right? So, but I just assumed that I should probably not call up all my friends and talk to them about my plan. So I created an international association with, complete with a board of directors, officers, you know, incorporation documents and plans to have an, a follow on, uh, so it's for two conferences, one in, the, in the California and then a follow on uh, in Italy in the spring, the following spring. So without t using any electronic means of communication and I went down to the local, uh, this was as a graduate student in computer science at Berkeley. There's a little tiny print shop off of Telegraph Avenue where they printed the most uh, you know, important stuff in the 60s. And I went in there and I had this, this invitation and then they printed it for me and you know, me and my girlfriend sat in the apartment and uh, stuffed the envelopes and we mailed them out and, and sure enough, it was a room like, you know, about this many people were there, it's all the top people in the field showed up and then there were these people in the front row who all filled out on the form that their home address was in Maryland but of course they were just here as private persons, no institutional affiliation. And so when I announced that by virtue of paying the $100 for the registration fee, that they were all now members of this International Scientific Association for Cryptologic Research, they, they turned green and it was over. It was done. And there's never, we've never heard any, any, anything about this again. So that was a, uh, an, a, an important enabler, I think, Here's a technology which I, I wrote about around the same time, early, well, late 70s and early 80s, uh, actually, and so-called mixing. And as you can see, the messages come in and then they are multiply encrypted like a Chinese or uh, uh, Russian dolls, and then they uh, each uh, successive mix node, we call it, has its key that's able to remove an outer layer and then it can permute them and send them on to the next node. And this w was invented in order to find a way to do elections on the new internet in, at that time, but it also turned out to be a really important way to protect privacy and communications. Not what is being said, but who is talking to whom and when. And we'll, we'll come back to that. That turns out to be the much more interesting and important thing. But one takeaway from this is it's very slow because there's a lot of public key encryption happening at each stage. And if you wanted to do this for a million messages every second, it would be a little much. So another thing that I invented right around the same time, very early 80s, it's what uh, Thomas is referring to, electronic cash. This was the idea that a number could be worth money. So it was the notion of a digital bearer instrument. And in addition to introducing that concept, which captured a lot of uh, people's imagination, it was very widely reported, I did it in such a way using an innovation which I call blind signatures that ensured that a, a kind of asymmetric privacy that if you were the 
and well, we can see it in the in the diagram if you if you look here. The the person who's with, going to withdraw a dollar from their account hides their banknote with their serial number on it that they printed themselves with in this envelope with a piece of carbon paper. Some of you may know what that is, uh, and sends it off to the bank. The bank notes them as seven six two places the signature stamp that only the bank can make, but it's always identical, on the outside of the envelope and returns it to the person. So now later when the person has removed the envelope, they have their own banknote with their own serial number on it that they can actually decide when to spend and the merchant will then send it on in and, and the bank will recognize it as coming from the merchant's account, the 914, will not have any idea who withdrew that money. So as a private person, where you spend your money is your own business with eCash. And in fact, that protection is, we say, unconditional in, in cryptography. It's information theoretic. It's, even if you could break every kind of cryptography ever invented, you wouldn't get any clue about who's, who withdrew that money. It also means that if you have that money, at home, in your computer at home, no one can take it away from you because unlike current ledger systems, right, you, they don't know how to stop it. They won't be able to keep it from being spent. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting technology and it actually works with binary denominated coins. So there, there are separate one cent two cent, four cent, eight cent, 16, so on, cent uh, digital bearer instruments and to make a payment just like when you pay with regular paper money and coins. You, you, you choose the uh, set of them that uh, adds up to the right uh, amount. And when computers deal with a binary denominated uh, system, it's, it's very efficient. So if, with 14 denominations, you would use it only an average of half a dozen coins to make a payment in exact sense, uh, roughly speaking. So, um, and actually, uh, this was later implemented, and you'll, we'll come to that, and that, that'll be really interesting, but um, back in this pre-World Wide Web stage, one, the thing I really wanted to do was make sure that everybody in the world knew that they could do everything they normally need to do as a consumer while protecting their privacy unconditionally and yet allow the legitimate interests of society to, be, society to be protected by the strongest cryptography available at the time. And this article was not only invited to the and featured on the cover of the best journal of computer science at the time, CACM, but the Scientific American, and uh, it was translated into German by several different groups and, uh, and published in uh, Spectrum der Wissenschaft, if I say that anywhere near correctly, and so on and so forth. So, but in many other languages, and so coming back to this idea of making sure that the, the, the the technology innovations needed to establish the feasibility of a world where people's normal lives are protected from computers was pretty well accomplished by this kind of uh, uh, action. And now for the kind of extra credit part. So as I mentioned, it's, it's not just about stuff that almost everyone does. Civilization's also about special things that smaller groups of people do and things that, they, that, they, that there might be groups to do if there was a way to do them and all kinds of uh, interesting new possibilities along those lines as we've, we've heard about earlier today, those of you who are here in part. And so, so the question is, did I just show in the Scientific American that it was possible to do ordinary stuff uh, and, 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 and leave all that other stuff on the table? Well, yes, but also 
In my spare time, I work with others, some of whom you can see in the photograph, and they, uh, some, you know, many of them are now in the blockchain space as of even just a short time ago. So these are some of the leaders in the, the field that came to a summer school, which I organized in Amsterdam uh, there um, quite some time ago, and a number of them ended up working with me on these theoretical results. I'd just like to try to set the record a bit straight on this, and I'm really sorry, but, you know, in academia, just like any other field, sometimes the people who are the more aggressive and collusive, you know, get the more credit or whatever, get the more stuff. So, in fact, this paper represents, that that diagram is from, the result of two earlier papers that were done by my colleagues at my research group and myself uh, in different combinations. One of them showed that if you have public key cryptography, then you can simulate the existence of a universally trusted party without having to have any such party at all. And I, I maintain that this is the like church touring equivalent of information security, and it would be understandable to a five-year-old. If you told a five-year-old, you know, your grandpa here is honest, never tells the wrong thing, never cheat, never lies, never reveals secrets about anyone to anyone else, and here's all the rules he follows, and you can always go there and talk to grandpa, and no one can hear what you're saying, and he hears what you say exactly, they would understand that that is a solution to any information security problem that is conceivable. Now, can you prove that? No. Can you prove that a Turing machine can compute anything that any other machine could compute? I don't think so either. But that's the conjecture. I think it's, it sounds pretty, pretty reasonable to me. And so what we showed was that you can always, if you have a set of rules for what this mutually trusted party is supposed to do, you can always simulate the existence of that party just by everyone else exchanging cryptographic messages among themselves. So here's my question for you. Does that remind anyone of anything? Is that something that we might all be interested in and know about? Does it sound kind of like Something that begins with a B, maybe? Right? I mean, this, this in general, proves that you, you could do anything with blockchain, in some sense. If, if, the, if the algorithm that's, if the, if the rules are computable by grandpa in polynomial time, then everyone only has to do polynomial time amount of work to participate in the network. And that's, that's, uh, an extraordinarily powerful result. But cryptographers aren't as foolish as you might guess because, of course, most polynomial time algorithms might not be efficient enough to use in practice. So what we proved is it's always possible to do it, but we're not showing you the efficient way to do it. For that, you have to come to us. And, okay, but, there's all, but we've pro proven there always is a way. Does that make sense? Okay, and that was based on encryption. You can, you can think of it uh, in some sense as uh, a, a, a kind of, um, well, let, let, let me not go further on that. So uh, this uh, work in progress that that would relate to, but there's another model that we also prove the same thing in, and that is if you assume you have an honest majority, so that if you don't have to know, sound familiar also? Yeah, so this is an honest majority, but you don't know necessarily which ones the honest ones are, but you're willing to assume that 51% that, that of your nodes or whatever are honest, then it turns out we can also get exactly the same result. Okay? And that paper, there was a competing paper uh, that got a lot of 
more citations by people who tend to cite each other's work, uh, but our paper got the Best of Stock Award, and we were then invited to the JCSS, the Best Journal, you know, featured and all that. So it was because we had stronger results and cleaner proofs. It was a better paper. There's no question. Um, and it was at the same conference. Similarly, when you go back and you look at the at the, the the paper based on the encryption, our paper was way better. But it's almost never cited. But it appeared at the same conference as the one that's always cited by people who are mainly in Israel and, and in MIT. Okay, and why would that, why, how can I say that for sure? Well, because it relates to this result, which I'm showing you now. Our paper had a special thing, which was that one of those nodes that you had to fix in advance was able to protect its secrets against even infinite computing power unconditionally, information theoretically, a single designated participant. And so it turns out that by combining that result with the, the uh, assuming an honest majority, by kind of making the honest majority simulate the, the, the distinguished participant, you can have your cake and eat it too. And this is my own work, this uh, so-called spymaster's double agent problem. And it's the, the, the general, strong result in this field, which is that if, even if the, uh, um, uh, a majority were to become dishonest, they would still have to break the cryptography in order to, like, spy on the others. So it's kind of, it's a pretty interesting uh, result in a very general case. So, I mean, we can now forget about all these inside baseball details, and I hope this helps you get some feeling for this very powerful idea that eventually, if we can think of things that the blockchain should do that make sense, there's a way to do it. And since the stuff that people need to do isn't that complicated, really, usually, you know, probably, and then as things get more complicated, well, it we'll find better and better ways to do it. For the stuff that most people do most every day, we already showed efficient constructions, and, and that's what I'll be talking about here. That's kind of like phase one. And then phase two is, okay, what can, you know, once that's built, can you, what else, where else can you take it? So, so in phase two, we wanted to to remind you, demonstrate and, and, and prototype and prove in practice that these systems could really work. And so one of the first ones that I was interested in was eCash. And so we uh, formed a company and demonstrated highway speed road toll payment with eCash in less than a meter of road travel with a very aggressive definition of what highway constituted highway speed, I think, 200 kilometers an hour. Is that right, or something like that? And um, demonstrated to a very uh, <laughs> suspicious uh, consultancy uh, that agreed that in 10 days, I think we had built this and demonstrated it, and so they couldn't help us give us this contract, and we started this company, and a lot of, um, People known to this gentleman over here had a lot of fun uh, from that. And um, so then uh, I'll also just briefly uh, touch on some uh, voting stuff, which is like the next thing, which is the, the Digicash was the eCash company, right? The Tacoma Park, Maryland is a real city in Maryland. So it's part of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. It's a real city. Half technocrats, half ordinary people live there. And we did the, the real city elections for them uh, in 2009, 2011, as you'll see, using a revolutionary new voting system. And voting is also something every, most people do on a regular basis, of course. Here, they do it much more often than most places, but um, I hope, but uh, at least it used to be, um, but uh, it's very important to, to the blockchain as well, right? The, uh, the, the governance, and we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. Um, and so we actually ran some real elections uh, 
of a unique new type, which I think is really well suited to blockchain and to society generally. And I'm going to show you just briefly also something really new that's not been presented before on voting. Uh, it's uh, easy to understand, I think, and quite important. So, but let's start with, with the uh, eCash. So remember the, the blind signatures and all. Um, and so I think if I push this button, we're going to see a video that was made 25 years ago in, in Geneva, where at CERN, I was asked to give one of two keynotes there. And not only the only keynote, but one of two. But mine was first, <laughs> OK? The other guy, some guy named Tim. So uh, any event, um, what I did was I made a, the first payment with eCash. It was from Geneva to Amsterdam. And I uh, then wrote a little press release of a few paragraphs about it, sent it back to a, a colleague at our company. I think Paul was part time at the, in those days, wasn't he? Vincent, yeah. And he set it out to some, I don't know, Dutch, whatever. And within 48 hours, it was all over the, 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 the major media on the, on the planet. People were thought so fascinating that you could actually make a digital bearer instrument and use it on the web. And you see, that sort of changed people's perception because, well, not to drag you into this, that era 25 years ago, we think of the web as a natural you know, thing that most people think it just sort of came with the planet. But it didn't. It was very, very hard fought. And even at that late juncture, it was unclear whether we would have consumers using the World Wide Web or consumers would get what were called set-top boxes. And those boxes would deliver 500 channels of media content of, uh, you know, from which a lot of people would make a lot of money, and they could also do some, a simple kind of search and you know, other kinds of text-based stuff, but in, like, like was done in France and in England. So uh, this was a big war. Were we going to get access to the web as consumers, or were we going to be, uh, were the 500 channel guys, were they going to win? That's why I gave this talk. But you see, it had, it had, a, it, it had an impact, I think, because it told people, hey, you can actually send real money over the web. You don't need to use a set-top box and move money, you know, have everything bundled and paid for for free with your subscription or what have you. So let's see if this movie works. So this is uh, an interesting possibility. It's a, it's a particular construction that, in fact, uh, uh, it is practical. Oh. This is where it starts to, now I, I was telling you that, well, we're going to have to pay for stuff in the information age, whether we like it or not, and now it's affecting me. Um, oh, well. Um, all right, I'm willing to pay for this sheet. Um, so I'll click this box here. Oh, let's see. 50 cents? Well, that sounds uh, reasonable. Okay. Oh, it's going to show me how to, a picture for showing me how to do uh, voting. That sounds like another kind of interesting thing to have. All right. We'll pay for that. I hope this mouse wants to click on this. No? Well known demo effect. Sorry? Mouse stopped it's working. It's not, ah, there it is. It's working. Okay. Make the payment. Sure. I'll, I'll go for that. That's the, the DigiCash eCash client. And there it goes. Ah, OK, it worked. So in fact, what I've just demonstrated to you, it's the first public demonstration of the first software-only electronic money for the network. We call it e-money. You just download this, this, this little application, and you can withdraw money and pay money and so on. And uh, maybe later you can see more of it. OK, so that's uh, pretty fun. 
So thanks, thanks to Thomas for recognizing that this is really the 25-year anniversary of that and that, yeah, electronic money emerged in, in, in Switzerland and uh, we issued it in an unpermissioned form which you today would call a, an airdrop, I guess. We said that anyone who opened a shop would, could would receive a hundred of these cyber bucks, and those are the logos on the screen there of uh, many of the, sh uh, the initial shops. And if you go to charm.com, I have a, like a digital museum, and you can hover over them and see links and go to see what their home pages look like according to the Wayback Machine at least. And then uh, later, you know, I sat with the board of uh, Deutsche Bank, my ponytail and my, my beard, which is much longer than this, but it wasn't as gray, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, they wanted to have it and they were a tough customer. Uh, as he also could tell you, they, uh, you know, they ran it in a data center that was several floors underground, and they wanted every kind of backup and fail safe and audit ability known to modern man. And we also had an issue by other, other banks, and uh, yeah, so that was uh, the proof that, yeah, eCash could really, really work. And uh, then let me just, I noticed I'm, I'm kind of going a little slower than I'd hoped, it's fun talking to you about all this, but. Um, Notice how this voting system that we did in Maryland worked. There was a pen, you see in that first frame there, that, that special pen, when you fill that oval to vote for that choice, the, the invisible ink in that, in that oval turns black. But the, there's a code in there, like that is those letters, that are unique per position and per ballot that don't turn black and they stay yellow. And that's the only way to reveal them because of all kinds of fancy chemistry. And so the, you can write that code down and then look on the website later and make sure that your vote was really recorded. And we did uh, surveys of every single voter and there was a, every third voter exactly was asked an open-ended question by a professional interviewer and these results were all reported in two publications and the public loved it. And the thing is that we, which most people didn't understand but they still loved it, that we could then prove that all those published codes really were consistent with the published outcome of the election. And there was no way that we could cheat that or anyone else could. In fact, anyone who wanted to could check that online. And they could write their own software or use this different software that other people had written and open sourced. So it was the first publicly verifiable election, remotely verifiable, transparently verifiable, however you want to call it. There had never been a, a binding election that had that property. And to tell you the truth, there have been precious few since. And I think that is what made, and I paid for that whole thing, by the way, that's all my equipment and so forth, but you can see a lot of famous cryptographers and those are the election officials and everything in the picture uh, up there. But uh, it pissed me off a bit, I guess I could say that standing up here, that you know, election officials weren't really lining up at our door saying, well, this is great, it's so much cheaper using off-the-shelf scanners and everything, we, you know, this is great, the public loves it and, and so forth. No, they were like, well, Okay, that's nice, but we, we'd like to keep buying them from the guys who keep giving us those tickets to go to Hawaii and, you know, buying us the steak dinners and all that. So we uh, kind of gave up on this technology, and I really started thinking of trying to find a way to have unpermissioned elections. Does that make sense? And that's what led me to what I call sample voting. And so these are some of the people on our scientific board who helped build, and it was rewritten like five times, and there's PhDs that various people got in all this, but we actually ran a binding election for the Council of Europe using sample voting. And we also did a lot of elections at like security conferences and stuff just to try to see if people could break it or anything like that. And 
it works real well. And I'd urge you to go to my website. You can like find the links to the sample voting and read about it. It's really, really super interesting because it essentially proves in a publicly verifiable way that it selects like a thousand people for each question, but totally randomly. And then it proves that their votes really are recorded correctly, just like we did in Tacoma Park. And so what that gives you is a, a system that, that, can you, that can conduct many, many elections. And voters only have to look at one question. They can really look at it for two weeks. They can use modern, the web and whatever to find out the answer, and they know that their vote really counts because they're in a small group and because of the integrity of the, of the process. So it is an election technology which scales with both the size and the complexity of society. And if you recall, those were the issues that caused us to move from the direct democracy of, of Athenian Greece to the representative democracy. But now that everybody's got a smartphone and access to the web, they're just like those Greek jurors. They could reasonably answer a question on a, on a relatively uh, detailed subject, if given two weeks. And, and it's, there's a whole literature on, on how jurors really rise to the occasion and really take their job seriously and so on. So this is an extremely promising technology. And in the context of blockchain, it's perfect because what you really want is the users of the chain to vote on specific code updates, not to vote on a platitude that some foundation is supposed to use to guide their development work, and, or, or worse, as you know. So this random sample voting allows that. We can have many contests as we like, and then those votes translate into actual executable smart contracts or whatever and, the, and, 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 and GitHub updates. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. But there's something even better about random sample voting and all which they don't tell you, and that is that almost all other voting that we have, even that in Switzerland, is really broken by blockchain. And this little cartoon from some of my new work in voting illustrates this. It, it basically, this is our solution up here, but the essential problem with other systems is just this, that you, you could sell your vote to someone online for some cryptocurrency, for example, and by simply uploading to them a video of your complete voting act. And in all other systems, that would convince them of how you voted. So any kind of vote by mail or vote any... So if you're not voting in a government-controlled booth, then this vulnerability exists. And it's very, very serious because now everybody's got these phones and, you know, more than half the people in South Korea, for example, trade cryptocurrencies, I recently read. So, I mean, that's, that's good news, but not, not for voting in South Korea. So here you'll see the, the only good solution to this problem that I'm aware of, and I don't want to get into the other ones, because the other one, because it's... it's I don't want to dwell on this too much because we're running low on time, but the essential idea and is that you, as the entity running the election, you provide what we call decoy ballots to voters to sell. And those decoys will not be counted, but they are indistinguishable forever from countable ballots. And so in order to make the system secure against the election official giving decoy ballots to real voters, because they're indistinguishable, we have to have what we call proof of decoy. Okay, so it sounds like a blockchain kind of thing, but it's, it's essentially 
that when you give a decoy ballot to a voter, say, go ahead and sell this to someone on the other side of your issue, and they know probably from your demographics that they want to buy it from you because you're on the other side, you're sure that it's not going to be counted because of this proof we're sending you separately, which you will, of course, not show them because then they will be mad at you, right? But you can be sure that your, this ballot you're selling is not going to be counted, but no one will ever know and they'll never be able to figure it out. So that's the proof of decoy. And you see the simple cartoon way we implement that here is that we put these stickers on the decoy ballots and then we send them out, mix them in with the other ballots. And if you get one of these, then you, you'll see the sticker and it says, hey, this is a decoy. Remove the sticker, fold it all back up, and now sell your vote, please. Okay? And another thing about the seventh uh, estate voting system, besides it being fun to do with like kind of a little party with your friends and you do all this physical stuff and it's real easy to understand and everything, is that we can pay voters to vote, but not in a way that will influence how they voted. And it turned out, this is a surprising twist, the only way that I could figure out to do that securely was by using blind signatures. So I was really pleased to see that. Um, anyway, so that's uh, the uh, end of the, the second phase. So we showed all that all those ordinary things, messaging, payments, all the, uh, uh, there were many uh, mix-based messaging systems deployed, uh, Tor famously now among them, but I open sourced this in the 80s and there was a whole series of Mix Minion and so on, uh, Mix Mastery, other, other zero knowledge uh, mixing systems. Okay, so let's talk now about the, the, the world we're in, and to me, and we've heard this earlier, the, the big thing is, I think, about blockchain, realistically, is, I mean, having done a lot of early work on it, by the way, so I'm sort of diminishing the, its, the significance of its you know, exact choice of mechanism, but the really interesting thing about it is that it can do extra governmental things. And it's not that governments haven't allowed extra governmental things in the past, but they don't make a lot of noise about them, but um, this allows you to, cr to create new things at a, at a, without incumbents being able to delay it and without the uh, kind of uh, delays that will, would, would make it not happen, and, and, it, and it's so fast that it can keep up with the rapid rate of change in society that it, it in partly enables. And so my uh, company, Elixir, has basically created what we believe, and I th hope you will agree, is the killer app for blockchain, which is it's the killer app for smartphones today, but then it has blockchain inside. And so it, and it further will allow the power of the multi-party computations that I was talking about, the extra credit stuff, to be seamlessly integrated as that stuff develops. So let's just take a quick look at Elixir, and I urge you to go to, to our homepage, and there's a video there where I, I talk about this a little more extensively. But basically, you have to understand, and I, I hope most of you, all of you do, that there's a fundamental difference between the message content, just exactly what you say, and everything else about that message. Who your friends are, when you talk to them, what other uh, things you interact with, and so on and so forth, the whole social graph, etc. That's where all the problems come from. And, you know, if you read the Mark Zuckerberg letter where he saw the light about privacy, I guess he had seen the light previous times, but and once again, you'll see that he, he's told you don't worry, 
He's going to help you protect end-to-end message encryption. It'll only take a few more years before they can sort out all the regulatory details with the, you know, the experts that he's got in mind. Uh, but uh, the metadata, don't worry about that. He needs to keep that to protect you from spam. So this is a kind of misdirection, like the, like the uh, magician that comes to your... Uh, your dinner table and wants you to look at the wrong thing. So WeChat, uh, you know, Facebook, these all kind of pointing in the direction of this being the killer app. And another way to look at it is sort of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. So once smartphones start doing everything that we really basically need them to do, then of course the next level of, of the Maslow Lowian hierarchy comes into play and people want their privacy, they want to own their own identity, they want to have their own keys, they want all these protections. And so that's basically, that's when they realize that they want, like we should have Facebook, but they want it with blockchain inside. And they want the immutability and the uh, censorship resistant and the, and the digital sovereignty and, uh, and all that. So. There are really four things we need to, to uh, requirements that need to be met in order to achieve this elixir thing, and one is speed, and we've got that. Um, one other one is uh, the, the privacy, and you know, most even the private coins don't really do it, and even eCash didn't really unlink. You know, eCash, eCash worked privacy perfectly if you physically visited places and they didn't take pictures of you. But, so, you, so there's the li- unlinking of, the, of who, of, the, of the, the MAC or IP address of the parties making the transaction, and then there's the unlinking of the transactions to transactions. And we use binary denominated digital bearer instruments in Elixir so that those transactions aren't really linked to each other like they are at all other blockchains where it's a check and it says, okay, this exact amount is being transferred from this wallet ID to that wallet ID. This is actual cash. So when you combine it with the, with the, with the high-speed mixing, you, you have something that uh, uh, actually protects privacy and you build it like Telegram has better, had had end-to-end encryption, all kinds of people jumped on. Well, now when they find out that Elixir has metadata protection and built-in currency, hopefully they'll all move over too, because there's no merchant discount and all that, and then we have to be able to scale, and we can. And the final issue, which you don't hear much about, in fact, is that Okay, I was here in Switzerland on another mission once, which was to break certain ciphers for, uh, with a white hat on. And I broke one, two of them. I mean, the two Swiss companies that had ciphers in those days. And I can tell you that, the, that from, break, from being in that world that the more random the function, the harder it is to break. And I think that's been known to governments. And so I don't think that any of the, and if you, if you look for a guy named Bill Binney, who was the director of the National Security Agency's technical division for many years, he recently gave a little snippet of an interview, which I think is still up, where he said that you probably shouldn't use any standardized encryption algorithm because the agency gets them in advance in software. And so, I'm not, so I'm not saying that I'm worried about quantum computers. I'm saying that the kind of cryptography that, that prevents a, a total break by quantum computers is the, is the best, the strongest kind. And so the, the, the bottom line here is simply that in developing countries and where all the growth is starting to happen, they don't really want to use systems where the bigger countries could come in and break the, the cryptography and destroy their economy in time of war, all that kind of thing. So you need to create a level playing field. So you want to use national laboratory level security in your, in your electronic money. 
That means that you shouldn't use cryptography that countries are unwilling to use to protect their national secrets and their command and control systems. So we, we solve that. We use really good stuff. And nobody else seems to even, they're, they're all moving in the opposite direction. All the real fancy cryptographers are, you know, hooking up really wild things that are based on a increasingly bizarre assumption. So um, that's uh, essentially what Elixir has done. And now I hope in the last three minutes I can, oh, two minutes of this video will show you about the technology breakthrough. And Suppose I'll say something Alice about wants to send a message to Bob, but she doesn't want anyone to know that the two of them are communicating. Message content can easily be protected by so-called end-to-end encryption, but this does not protect the information about who is talking to whom and when. The metadata, which is increasingly recognized as far more revealing and more challenging to protect. Each member of a team of nodes, in order to protect the metadata, successively shuffles the batch of encrypted messages using its container of secretly arranged tubes and sending the messages without delay through to the next team member. Even just a single node can keep senders from being linked to recipients. Alice also gets a receipt informing her confidentially that her message was provided to Bob. Team members then destroy their secret pattern of tubes, making way for a new team ready for a new batch. Earlier, each node is chosen independently as a kind of random secret key, which input tube to connect to which output tube. Elixir's breakthrough over the type of messaging I open sourced in the 80s is a way that enables almost Mixing. all the work to be done well in advance, yielding the only known way to provide real-time metadata protection smartphone to smartphone. Lead can also pay you me by sending what appears to be an ordinary message, but that actually contains numbers that serve like metal coins and paper money. Digital I've called such denominated, unforgeable numbers, digital cash, first issued by DigiCash in the 90s. Elixir's breakthrough improvement on the original digital cash now makes it fully distributed and quantum resistant. Elixir thus is able to uniquely provide a new, ultimate metadata level protection of confidence confidentiality in all your online communications and payments for the first time giving you a protected sphere protecting your digital world today and your digital future okay so let me just talk about the dApps in the last minute uh, because that's where we go beyond just messaging and payments and direct democracy on the on the on-chain governance and the essential thing is that we don't run the DAP engines or the apps, DAPs on chain. We run them off chain in different marketplaces, and some of which we uh, have developed ourselves and others in partnership. And, and we're open to any, of course, and DAP engine marketplace. But the, the key thing is that we have an efficient way, an extremely efficient way to um, allow these, these multi-sigs to basically interface to the, there we go, to the, uh, on to the actual ch main net chain. And so we divide the, the app or the, the um, uh, smart contract into that part which is able to control the messaging and payments aspect to create it's a, a virtual presence of the, of the thing on chain that's as good as if it were running on chain, but actually it can run in the off chain distributed manner of its choice because some dApps need, you know, different kinds of chips like GPUs or AI chips or they need big databases or they need to be very uh, protected against uh, different kinds of, of threats. So, uh, once we get the acceptance of users and, and the footprint, we will hope to be a, a very attractive platform where people can easily launch dApps to provide all the extra new interesting things that will uh, enable this space to really reach its full potential. So thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the speech. So this closes our uh, public part of the conference and uh, we will then proceed to the uh, dinner for those uh, who join us with the invitation. Thank you very much.